sometimes it's fun to be a bitch. I call it S&M, but some people call it SM. S&M, I don't know exactly what S&M is. Sadomasochism, I suppose. With some chains, maybe? <laughs> I'd say definitely handcuffs, being tied up. I think it's great. I think control is probably a big part of it. Well, I enjoy the hell out of it. It will probably mean different things to different people. I mean, to me, it means um, it's, it's the psychosexual kind of thing. My name is Karen, and I'm in my early 20s, and I'm a dominatrix. A dominatrix is a woman who likes to dominate a person in a physical, emotional, and sexual manner. S&M to me is just comfortable. I was always shy growing up. I, I was always a good girl. I always did exactly what my parents told me to do. I always did exactly what the teachers told me to do. I only wanted to please other people my entire life. I still have that problem now. S&M has sort of helped me express a little bit more dominance in my own life, not over other people, but just knowing how to say what I want, when I want, how I want, and not feeling like an ogre. Sadomasochism is a sexual relationship between two people, two consenting people, who um, one person is a sadist and one person is a masochist, and giving pain doesn't make the sadist feel guilty, and receiving pain doesn't make the masochist feel, feel weak or feel degraded. For a lot of people, sadomasochism is like a game. It's, you, you sort of role play. The idea is that you sort of get out of yourself and, and the restrictions that you might feel in everyday life and you can get out your aggressions or your inhibitions or something like that and, it, and, and it's, it's used that way a lot. It's almost like acting in the sense that all of a sudden they lead this typical normal life where they have their work and they do this and then at night they can dress up, you know, in leather and go out and say, okay, I'm a dominatrix and I'm going to do this. I, uh, I'm a regular guy. I, I have a job, I have a nine to five job. I work at a marketing research firm. I'm a data, data analyst, I work with computers. So my look is, you know, my demeanor, my whole persona has changed come Monday. My nose ring, all my piercings are hidden when I go to work. In the story of O, oh, which is a book about this woman who volunteers to be held sort of like a captive or as a slave in this, in this place, um, when she's released, she has to wear like an iron ring on her finger, which any person seeing her down the street and seeing this iron ring on her finger will then be able to identify her as like part of the group. And there's nothing that I know of that in, in real life that does that. Um, for S and M, you can't you can't tell because just because a woman is walking down the street and wearing high heels or thigh highs or or a, you know some sort of a corset thing. I mean, it could probably be normal people that you see walking down the street that you may see in a grocery store, and you may not even have a clue that they go home and strap it on and have a good time. But this, these are real people. These are people that you can actually, you know, deal with. You know, this is reality. You got your businessman, you got your deep house, you got your techno, you got your uh, hip-hop groovers, you got gay, lesbians, you got, you know, it's pretty much cool. It's like everybody getting along, you know? Some people that are into it, I was totally surprised that they were interested at all. And a lot of people that I thought would be interested, like, were totally shocked that I would ask. You know, with the music and, and the clubbing and stuff, I would think that a lot of people are into are into the fashion aspect of it. It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell who is and who isn't. Then again, sometimes it's really easy. A lot of people think that I'm like a librarian, you know? It's like, you know, got the whole glasses thing going, and, and uh, it, it surprises a lot of people to find out that that there's more to me than just, you know, a studious sort of quiet person. Sometimes I really like to make a man cry. 
it's I sort of before I start whipping them, I decide that's what I'm going to do. That's my goal, and I won't stop until they do cry. And it's sort of sexy to feel that power. And I know that if they don't like it, they always have the safe word. But it gives me sort of an edge. That's that's what you want. The, the hardest part to understand about S and M is that you assume that they don't want it because it's painful or it's unpleasant or it's strange. But that's the whole point of S and M is that you do want it, and this is how you get it. And I look at it like I'm sort of doing them a favor. It's, I'm not trying to make anybody uncomfortable or upset. I'm trying to give them what they want. B and D stands for bondage and discipline, which is different from sadomasochism because sadomasochism infers that there's somebody who's being cruel and somebody who's taking the punishment. But bondage and discipline is is a little bit different because it wouldn't include necessarily any like hitting or any any physical contact. It could be you know verbal domination. One person being a dominant figure, and the other person just basically in any kind of bondage type situation. Use ropes, leather strengths, chains, hold them down, or have someone else hold them down. Any kind of constriction involved is, is bondage. I use real handcuffs, I use real chains. Uh, you know, real locks that you need real keys in order to get out of. And because if you have a chain around your wrist or something, that that can hurt after 20 minutes of being on your wrist. You know, it's like, um, it, it, sort, it sort of digs in there. Handcuffs are really good because you can just slap them on. You don't have to worry about, you know, positioning, like you have to position the ropes or something like that. With the handcuffs, you just slap them on. It does the job and they're they're hooked and they can't they can't get out. I use different kinds of rope. Some rope I have is, is pretty thin and I don't really like using that because it cuts into your skin a lot more and it, it also it just aesthetically it doesn't look as as sturdy. And so I but I do have that because it's it's good for, for smaller things like if you just want to you know tie your wrists together or something. But I also have thicker rope that's, that's good for ankles or if you want to, you know, be tied all up, then you can use that to tie really strong knots. Disciplining a slave is something that is absolutely imperative because it goes along with the whole trust thing. If you don't discipline your slave, then they're not going to trust that you'll take care of them, they're not going to trust that you know what you're doing, and it, it ruins the whole, the whole dynamic of the relationship. It's like, what is discipline? You're disciplined into doing something. You're, you're, you're put into bondage and you're forced to do something against your will, or correct it, so to speak. And it's, and it's really important that you do it strictly. You can't just say, you know, no, sweetheart, don't do that. You have, you know, you have to say, take your hand off there right this minute before I whip you. I won't tolerate a slave that doesn't take my directions to the T. You, you can't, you can't deal like that. You can't, you can't have a relationship with somebody if they don't take what you say seriously and know that you mean no. There is a way to stop whatever action is going on that you don't like. If a slave would, would be talking or, or just doing something annoying with his mouth, then boom, like that, I'd put a gag on him. And if he was um, looking at me and I told him distinctly, do not look me in the eye, um, I'd you know, put a blindfold on him. If he was, if he was being you know, really restless and, and like groping for me or something like that, boom, tie his hands up. It's so easy to control what they're doing because you have it all right there at your fingertips and it makes that makes disciplining e easy. They get the point, they know. If they don't like the gag and they're talking and you say, stop talking, they know, well, gosh, 
I don't want to gag, so I better stop talking. And it gives you control. I think the whole eroticism behind s and is the fact that you just feel completely helpless at that time. And to have someone have complete power over you and your emotions and your sexuality is an intense experience. Nipple clamps, the most painful thing, it just kills. So if you ever want to like really torture somebody, you put like a nipple clamp on and then like flick it like that and it hurts. Uh, you can use clothes pins to do that if you want like if you don't want to spend money but you are curious now that I just said that it's really painful and you want to try it at home. I mean I like to dabble in everything. I mean I'm in the needles, no drugs. In the needles for piercing, uh, B and D, tattoos, you name it. You know, I've tried it and liked it. I'm a big girl in size and body and personality. And it's nice to know that there's people out there who are larger than me in life and in physical stature. And to make me feel, I don't know, petite and demure and womanly, I guess. That's my appeal to being dominated. Some people are into neglect, which is to say that they like to just leave their partner or they like to be left by their partner in an uncomfortable position for an extended period of time. And one time I left Charles overnight in his apartment and it was, I have to admit it was kind of scary because if something had happened he wouldn't have been able to get out. But it was, that was part of the thrill of it, was that he was, he was left on the floor of his apartment all night long, couldn't do anything without me, couldn't get out. And I knew it, you know, I'm sitting home in my, in my room or getting up in the morning and knowing that Charles was, was just on the floor where I left him. And when I came back the next day, there he was, and he was just waiting for me. He likes to be tied up. And so I used to, you know, go over to his house and tie him up all day long. Just just tie him up and just leave him there. You know, for the most part of the day, he had a, a big post in his bedroom where his, you know, where his sliding closet doors met. In the middle, there was a post. And I used to tie him up to that post and leave him there for a long time. And it was also great because while he was on there, I could whip him. And we had a really great riding crop. And you, you, can, you can hit somebody for hours with a riding crop. And, and it, it hurts after a while, but it's, it's not like unbearably sharp pain or anything like that. So we could, we could just have fun for a long time. One time, I wanted to try something new, and so I put Charles in the bathroom, on the floor in the bathroom, and chained him to the base of the toilet. I'd say it's pretty erotic, um, in the sense that sort of the person takes control over you and you have, you're helpless in that sense or you have the um, objective to be superior over someone else. A lot of people misunderstand S&M and, and they think that it has to be extreme pain or really horrible and hideous. When in truth is, it's, it can be very playful and very fun and if you, if you hit somebody for 20 minutes, it might not ever even cause them pain. Fingernails, shoes, gloves, corsets, leather. fetish clothing. I think of um, a lot of leather, um, like thigh-high boots, spiked heels, or some people like, like things that have a lot of like straps. It's like bondage. They look like their clothes, sort of, like they're in bondage in their very clothes. Corsets make you stand up straighter and taller and give you more power. They're very sexy to feel around your waist and you feel more feminine when your waist is all clinched in and it, it looks good too, it looks very severe. 
A good corset is leather, and it's boned, and it's gonna, it's gonna lace up the back where you can cinch it real good. I prefer them in black, too. I think that they're sexier, just like I prefer black lingerie as opposed to white or red. But some people prefer white corsets that look really Victorian. Those are pretty cool, too. Gloves are really interesting because they make you look dominant. Some people like gloves because it puts a barrier between the slaves and the dominatrix because they don't think that they're worthy of being touched by her. And oftentimes, I don't want to touch my slave either. You want to keep that distance and that respect. I like long leather gloves that go, you know, full length up my arm. I think boots are very sexy. Boots, they have this dominant feel to them that's just like, it's very sexy. With heels or without heels, boots are sexy. When I put the boots on, I definitely feel more sexual, more womanly, but in control. There's just a different presence about me that the guys, some men will automatically turn and just go, oh yeah, and you got them. <laughs> you have them in a way that there's nothing else can describe. Spike heels, I mean, a woman could be effing naked over on the other side of you. And it's these boots, baby, they just draw the animal magnetism to you. What is it like being somebody who has a boot fetish? Sometimes, for the person who has a fetish, they you can't seem to have sex without that fetish being involved. I have a boot collection from when I was with John Paul uh, just because he liked them so much. He would always fantasize about them and different clothes I could wear with boots and going out into public and having boots on, me kicking him wearing boots, me being tied up with boots on, me tying him up and straddling him with boots, uh, him licking my boots while I'm talking with friends on the phone, just everything. Shoes, I love shoes. Shoes seem fun, they seem trendy and sexy. They can make you look dominant, they can make you look submissive. They look great with high heels and, and your ankles chain. They look great. I'm serious. I, I rarely doodle when I'm bored, but when I do doodle, it's always of shoes, high heeled shoes, ever since the time I was really little. It's just something that appeals to me aesthetically. I wear my fingernails short. However, I, I can see where like long, especially red nails, can look really sexy. They look kind of bitchy and catty and mean. Collars are the coolest thing in the world. They make you look so submissive and they feel really good around your neck. You know, I, like, I, have, I have a really thin neck and it just, it looks really good to see like a collar, you know, strap tied around my neck. Some people find tattooing very erotic because it's painful and because it's sort of a degradation of their body. You know, they, it's, they, they consider it like a, an announcement to the world that they would put their body through that sort of stress. And at the same time, they, they find it beautiful. And yeah, for a lot of people, it is a part of S&M. Some people even, you know, home make their tattoos. They will carve the, the initials of their master in, you know, in their thigh or something like that. Piercing is something much like tattooing that isn't something that I'm into, but a lot of people are. Basically, for the same reasons that they tattoo themselves, it's, it's sort of a rush and plus you also have the mark on your body that you've done this, that you've experienced this pain. Leather is something that, that's very rough looking. It, it's very, you know, it's very earthy and very strong and it sort of commands a magnetism. And the clothes that you make out of leather tend to be very sexy, short skirts, you know, tall boots, long gloves, you know, thick collars, um, tight bustiers and corsets. You can make all sorts of clothes out of leather and you can cut it in ways that are very flattering and very, very right for the whole mood of S&M. 
I don't think everyone in S and M likes gloves or necessarily even likes boots. I do think that that the reason why they do like them is because it looks so strict and it looks it looks sexy. I mean, it's it's classy and it's slutty at the same time. sort of feel to it, you know. Um, you know, it's a woman who, who wears riding boots, um, jodhpurs, and, you know, has a whip. This is called a lunging whip. So the short crop is used for jumping and you'll normally use it on the hindquarters and you'll take your hand around the side and tap on the hindquarters. If you go into an equestrian store to buy a whip or, or, or anything, it's kind of a, a thrill and kind of a sick way that you're not dealing with a person who's used to dealing with people buying sexual merchandise like a person you would find at a sex shop. You go up to a, pers a salesperson at, at an equestrian store. They have no idea what you're buying it for, and, and in a way you feel kind of like you have a secret, and it's kind of, it's kind of fun. This is a dressage whip. You can see it's much longer. It has um, a little cap on the top so that it doesn't slide through your hand. Okay, dressage is basically the basic training of the horse. Um, horses that are trained English, there are certain sets of signals that they're given to try and encourage them to do things. And dressage is really those basic training signals taken to a competition form. Um, the ideal dressage horse is one who is well muscled, is using his body properly. Just like we might say that um, a dancer is, is a human being who uses their body well, a, a dressage horse is kind of like the equine equivalent of a dancer. And we ride preset tests that are designed to test how well the horse moves, how well he bends, basically how well he uses his body and how well he's being trained. It's classy and it's, it's, it's an everyday sort of, sort of feeling to it, but at the same time, it's, it's sexy, it's kind of strict. These boots you ride in when you're jumping, when you're going cross country, when your legs need protection from things that you might be jumping, or when you're doing dressage and you need a good grip on the saddle with the hole inside of your car. The short boots are just, you need to ride in a boot with a heel so that your foot doesn't slide through the stirrup. So the short boots are comfortable if you just want to put jeans on and just go for a ride around and you're not going to really be doing any hard work. Another thing about the equestrian idea is that a lot of the equestrian accoutrements like crops and the, the bridles and I mean even the saddles, everything, there's straps and there. You go, you go into an equestrian store and just about anything in there, save for like the, the horse feed or something like that, you can use. The great sturdy leather straps that you can use for you know, you know, tying somebody up, it's practical too. You don't, you don't feel like, a, like you're going into a sex shop or something like that, but still you can use just about anything in there. The main thing about all of the whips is they're never ever used for punishment. They're used to back up a, a signal that you're giving with your leg. And if, if the horse is not listening or if he's not understanding you, you tap him with one of the types of whips to back up and reinforce the signal. If you ever see somebody hitting a horse hard with a whip, in a show, they'll be disqualified. That's cruelty. It should never be used for punishment. I, I don't know how else to explain it. It's just sort of a thrill. Just like when I wear my riding boots to school or to work or something like that. It's, um, I know that I'm wearing them because they're, they make me feel attractive. Just like, if, like another woman would wear high heels to work or wear a short skirt to work because she feels attractive and sexy and everything like that. And, and powerful, and I do the same thing, but mine is a little bit more subtle.
sex was one of the first things that I was exposed to as soon as I as soon as I started getting into S and M. And you can, you can talk about whatever you want with anyone, but there's there's like certain lines that you can talk to that are specifically about sex. And so I, I filled out this um, sort of like questionnaire about myself because a lot of singles meet this way. And when I first logged on, I just logged on as Karen. And nobody really responded to me, but I changed my handle to Mistress Karen, and all of a sudden, just like that, I had I had a ton of people wanting to ask me questions or who wanted to talk with me and sending me email and, and you know wanting to chat with me and everything. And I ended up meeting this guy whose handle is Zeus, and he lived in Kansas, and I would talk to him on the computer um, a couple times a week for a while. But I would dominate him over the computer. I would tell him what to do, and he told me that he had done it. Good evening, at the tone, Pacific Daylight Time will be 11 o'clock at 20 seconds. Dude, this is Mr. Karen. This email is to tell you that you have two days to comply with my previous order. I expect an email back telling me that you've obeyed. If you'd like to make a call, please hang up and try again. If you need help, hang up and then dial your operator. Describe to me what it felt like last night when I instructed you to sleep on the cold tile floor. It's not nice to make a mistress wait. I demand an immediate apology through the modem, convincing me that you are even worthy of my punishment. This is Mistress Karen, Mistress Karen. I demand you buy me a gorgeous leather corset and mail it to my P.O. box at once. Pacific Daylight Time will be... Perfect. Pathetic. Pathetic. 12 o'clock. And it was fun because it was safe and it also gave me a good indication of how many people are into S&M and how many people don't know about it but are really curious and they wanted to talk to me and ask me questions. It, it was really fun. The first time I went into a club, I was really new at s and I mean, I'd never done anything. And it, it surprised me how many people were just wild, you know, just doing all sorts of things. It's sort of like this pleasure room where women are actually like sort of chained up and you can walk in and like there's whips and there's all this crazy stuff going on. I see a lot of people who are transvestites. You see a lot of people who are into bondage in the sort of um, like the art of bondage. And they're, they're just like, tied up like in crazy ways. It's more of a kick back, relax, you know, dance, have fun. <laughs> Just entertainment. Yeah. Hey, I got whipped. You know, what the hell? Sometimes you see people who who do like uh, like demonstrations sort of, you know, like candles, like a lot of people, you know, will drip candle, hot candle wax on, on other people. It's like you come here and you know that you're not going to get judged. It's just another sexual exploration, really. You see a lot of people, you know, dancing and, and you know, doing all sorts of things that you'd see at a normal club. I mean, it's nothing dark and gothic about it, you know, necessarily. But you, you, just, you just see a lot of people expressing their sexuality in ways that you might not see if you went to just a regular disco kind of club. At a party I was at, I saw this woman who was really, really tiny, like under five feet tall, and really, really thin, and she was with this man who was a transvestite and was wearing this wig. I mean, he was obviously a man. I think he might have even had a mustache or something. And, um, and she was just tying him up to the chair with these really, really big, thick ropes. And it was just so aesthetically cool. It's like nothing you'd ever see before. And it's nothing you, you would see in a video about s and M. I I mean, it's something you have to see live, that's spontaneous, that's fresh. And it's, it's really appealing just to see these people doing what they want to do and, 
and, and just having fun. At most parties, private parties and clubs, drinking is prohibited and a lot of people who are into the whole role-playing aspect don't drink and at just general public clubs very often you'll see people drinking but they're not the people who are really into any sort of games. I don't see any problem with that. I mean, you know, if you're talking about drug, I've never seen. Oh, no, 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 no. You got security guards here and they're pretty big and, you know, I mean, you want to be a bad boy, go into the back room, get whiffed, you know? When you're a bottom, you know, the one on the receiving end, you experience an endorphin rush. It's a high. It's a natural high. And sometimes it's pretty addicting. It's a sex drug. Men like to watch, women like to get whipped. They go for the action. I'd say men are more into being dominated. Maybe definitely. I have a tough time finding finding partners that are interested, you know. Um, I mean, I'm straight and you know believe it or not, there is a shortage of dominant women out there. <laughs> I, I look at a person and I just sort of get signals. You know, body language, you make eye contact first and you see if the person is susceptible to coming over and talking to you, you approach them, you talk to them, you tell them what you're into and what you like to try and go from there. I don't know, I like to dominate, so I can understand that. I don't like to be, I don't like to have someone have control over me, but I think it's interesting to have control over another person. At a club where there's s and activity, there, there is a certain amount of etiquette that you have to follow. You don't, you don't like go up to somebody that's obviously a slave and has you know been tied up or whatever and touch them or bother them or anything like that especially without their masters or mistresses permission the people that um, spank people are very very connected to what the other person is feeling and they will not go beyond what your tolerance is well I've been doing this so long with so many different people I know if I'm hurting somebody I mean, it's pain involved, but there's a threshold point you hit, and you have to be in tune with how hard you're hitting somebody. Sometimes the power play gets to be too much, and maybe I would go over the top or something like that. And so, in which case, we have a safe word, which Charles would use to mean stop. You know, I've had enough. And that word, he just calls me Karen, instead of calling me mistress or mistress Karen. That would uh, just let me know that he's had enough, that this isn't, hey, come on, this isn't funny anymore, that sort of thing. That way we, we always know that there's a balance and that, that I'm never going to do something that's going to make him uncomfortable or I'm not going to do something that he doesn't want to do. Charles used to tell me that sometimes he was too into it to use a safe word, that he felt that it would, that he didn't want that sort of power. He wanted to be more helpless than that. <laughs> Trust is one of the most important aspects of S&M. You need to you need to feel comfortable with your partner and you need to have a, a communication going with them. It's sort of intimidating because you see all these people who know all this stuff that, that they're doing, they have all this hardware, they, they know all these people. And so when, when I first you know, started in on it, I wanted to be submissive, not necessarily just because that was my taste and that's what I felt, but more than anything because that's what I felt comfortable with socially. I didn't want to seem like I didn't know what I was doing and if I had a master with me then you know, he would take care of everything. So that's what I did. My first partner with S&M was Charles, and there's this woman who I was friends with and who he was friends with, and I was talking with her, and, and I 
I, you know, expressed that I was curious about it and, and this and that. She's like, oh, you should get together with Charles because he knows all about that sort of thing. Um, when Charles and I went on our first date, I didn't know what to expect because I'd never been in this sort of situation before. And so the first thing we did when we got in the car, he told me to sit on my hands. And I was like, okay, you know, I mean, what, what do you do? And I did. And I mean, it was like really exciting because I was being told what to do and I was like, I was learning now what, what it's all about, what it feels like and everything that I had imagined it to be for years, I was now finding out. I, I was like, I was really nervous. I mean, what, what, what is S&M in, in this sort of relationship? I, I wasn't sure if I should be really embarrassed by being somebody's slave or if I should be loving it. It was a sort of a confusing thing because I, I, I didn't want to admit that I might actually like this. He um, got out of the car and he pull, went to the back of the car and pulled out some rope and then he, you know, opened my door and the door behind me, it was a four-door car, and he, he, you know, took my arm sort of, um, like, behind my back like this, but like, like around the chair, so my arms were behind the chair like that, and, and tied them like that. So I was sitting, you know, I had my seatbelt on, and I was just, you know, I was sort of strapped in there. I mean, I really didn't have a choice. And so I was, I was sort of getting used to the whole, the whole idea of just, you know, just being submissive means letting somebody else take control and trusting somebody else, and that's what I was doing. I was, just, you know, I was, I was completely helpless, and, and, but I felt safe because I didn't do it with somebody that I hadn't spoken with beforehand. I mean, I talked to Charles on the phone about S&M and what I was curious about and what, like, didn't appeal to me, and we sort of, we had like this whole, it was like a whole communication and everything going on before this happened, so I felt really safe. No, I did not feel like I was going to get raped or abused or I, I did not feel like I was in any sort of danger at all. One time Charles left me in his apartment while he went away to go do something and he, first he chained me all up into a little ball and, and kept me on the floor and he left and it was, it was so miserable because it hurt and there was no way I could get out of it. and. And all I could hear was the clock ticking. Straight fist bondage is completely different than any other kind of bondage because you are, your whole body is, is you know, tied to a pole and you cannot move anything. And in, in the first month or so that I started dating Charles, he tied me up, blindfolded me, he put like a gag in my, well it wasn't a gag, it was a this rope that he, you know, tied my head, you know, like, uh, like that, and, um, and he left me there for quite some time while he went off into the kitchen to make dinner, and he came back, um, maybe 20 minutes, a half hour later, something like that, and he just fed me dinner like that, he took the, you know, the rope out of my mouth, but I was still blindfolded and I couldn't see what what was coming in my mouth and sometimes it was food, sometimes it was liquid and sometimes he would kiss me and it was sort of fun because I was all helpless and everything but still I felt, I felt safe. One time, the, actually it was like the first time I was ever, I was ever whipped was with Charles and I was submissive and he had this bed and he, uh, you know, sort of stretched me out on it. My arms were, were tied to the to the headboard. My feet were tied to one of the poles on, on the footboard. And took off my shoes. And he took his riding crop and was hitting my feet. Um, when he started whipping me, it was it was really you know soft little pats almost. And and it just sort of built up more and more and more and more. And until the point where like I was crying because I mean the the repetitiveness of it and just the intensity of being hit. And I mean, it's, it's kind of scary. And I ended up crying, but I just kept hitting it and hitting it and hitting it and hitting it and hitting it until the whip broke. And it was, it was very, very painful. It was really wild to, to experience that. I mean, if you've never been whipped before, it's a totally different experience than you would ever think it to be. Yeah, Charles was 
prefers to be submissive and he he would uh, only be dominant for me because I felt like I was too much of a newcomer to be you know comfortable with the whole thing and once he showed me the ropes so to speak um, then then I got the hang of it and then it was no problem for me to be dominant the first time I was dominant was actually just I mean, I was really in a moment of frustration and I had to take control of the situation. I was, I was still, you know, seeing Charles and he was sick and he'd been sick for like, I mean, I'd only been seeing him for two months and six weeks out of those two months he'd been sick with a sore throat and he wouldn't kiss me. And so I was, I mean, I really started to get really pissed off and I called his machine because I knew he was going to be gone. And and I said, you know, when you get your butt back here, I'm going to whip it into shape. And he got back, and he was so excited that I finally decided to be dominant. Like, I decided to be dominant. And, um, and it was really the turning point. I, don't, I feel like if I didn't have that kick, I might have been too intimidated to, to like, really express myself. But, I, I mean, I had a real cause to, to be dominant. And, and it works better that way. You can't, you can't fake it. You can't pretend like you want to. I mean, you, want, you have it in you, and that's that. And Jane was my neighborhood friend. Actually, we went to school together, and we used to play this game. We'd, just, we'd sort of like go in the living room. Um, behind, behind my couch, we had this big table, and it had you know, big, sturdy legs on it, and it was pretty long, about like six feet long or something like that. And we used to go back there and we'd play, you know, all sorts of games. So, but usually we play games like with our Barbies or things that I wouldn't want my mom to walk in and like see me playing. And this one time I, I saw this curtain sash that was, that was in my living room and I just, I just took it and I, and I tied her down, you know, to, this, to that, you know, post. And on on the on the table, and she was upset at first. I mean, because we were, we were struggling, but I like really really wanted to tie her down to that post, and uh, so I did. And she was fine after that. And it was just I don't know. It it was my first experience with ever feeling that feeling of wanting to tie somebody down. I think it all goes back to their childhood in terms of how they were treated as children and some people actually get turned on if they were treated um, well as a child, sort of had a normal typical stereotypical life where everything was fine and everything was great. Um, it's a turn on to them to sort of be treated badly. I wasn't hit as a child, I wasn't neglected as a child, nothing like that. I think that a lot of the curiosity is because they've never been abused and that's sort of they've been so normal for so long that they want to explore new territories that they haven't I don't know explored some people believe that that S&M is is a sexual orientation that that for some reason they can't enjoy sex without a form of pain or humiliation for a lot of people it is something that they just try on, you know, their quest for many different sexual experiences. Some people use S&M as a lifestyle where there's a mistress, a professional mistress, and she has a dungeon in her house and she has like two or three live-in slaves or something like that. And a lot of people in real life actually do live that lifestyle where they have a dungeon downstairs, they converted their basement to a dungeon and their spouse or boyfriend or whatever comes in and, and will stay there and it's, it's always set up, it's not just something they shove away in the closet when they're done, it's something that's, that's out in their home. It's not meant to intentionally like degrade the person or say that they're less of a person or for a person to use their anger on another human being. What it is, is it is a fantasy, just like any other fantasy. I'm a virgin. I'm just saving my virginity until I'm married. 
I don't think intercourse is part of S&M. I think S&M is a big sort of foreplay. It just gives you a pleasure that food, men, nothing else can get out of you. Intercourse can be a big part of S&M if, that, if that's what you want. And a lot of couples who are experimenting with S&M, that, that's how they do it. They, they'll be having intercourse and you know, one of them will be chained to the bed, something like that. And then it plays a big role because the, the main objective is to have intercourse. For a lot of people who are into S&M on a consistent basis, having intercourse is just icing on the cake. The, the main sexual play is, is the sadomasochism. Just, just being in that environment is stimulating enough and sometimes it leads to intercourse, sometimes not. It just, it just depends. 75% of the time when I'm doing S&M, there's no intercourse involved at all. Maybe a little masturbation, mutual masturbation sometimes, but no intercourse at all. I mean, it's, it, to me, it's the safest sex around. expression and when when you do it right and you're doing it the way that you feel comfortable you feel like you've you've just released a lot of tension and that you've that you've gained a lot of trust in the person that you're with whether a man wants to dress up as a woman or a woman wants to be bound and gagged and spanked it's it's all in good fun I mean, everyone's doing their own thing pretty much personally I just think that if, if anyone wants to do it two people want to do it and you know they're not hurting anyone they're doing it in their own space everything's consensual let them do it you know why not it's fun it's uh it's entertainment what else it's like an acute aesthetic but it's like not just like visually it's it's a, it's like a, an inner aesthetic it's like what feels right it's just something you sort of bottle up inside of yourself for a long time and once you let it out you, just, you tell your friends and you tell your family and for them it's like it opens up a conversation just about your life and the way you look at things and it feels like a real release knowing that people know you that much better and that's, and that's what it is, it's, it's that you're sharing more of yourself. S&M feels unlike you would imagine it to feel. You think that it would be scary or weird or painful or miserable or something like that and the whole point is that you find your own niche where you are comfortable and you can just sort of let yourself go whether you're dominant and you can let yourself go by just expressing your agitation or, or something on other on another person or you're submissive and you enjoy showing devotion to that person and to you know to the person who's dominating you A good mistress is somebody who's really creative, really inventive, really brave. I mean, you have to be. You have to be willing to explore not just not just, you know, different sexual things, but you also have to be willing to explore other people and their feelings and you have to be sensitive to that because if somebody's uncomfortable with what you're doing, then it's right out the window. You you can't you can't be a good mistress and be as heartless as you act.